It reads like it came from Hollywood, but it is very real. There is one less entry on the FBI's 10 most wanted list today. Good evening. He was the number one most wanted criminal in America, and today the FBI got their man. Here he is in the police photo we just received, looking like your friendly neighbor next door. Anyone who's ever been in Boston knows who Whitey Bulger is, a ruthless mobster accused of over a dozen murders, on the run for years, a fixture on the FBI's most wanted. List. Tonight, after more than a decade as a fugitive, Bulger is in custody. The capture came as a direct result of a campaign aimed at locating Bulger's longtime companion, Catherine Grieg. He originally disappeared in 1995 after a retired FBI agent alerted him to an imminent indictment. Bulger was a leader of the Winter Hill Gang, a group of local criminals based in South Boston. He has been indicted in 19 murders. His story has long captivated the city of Boston and has been the subject of several books, as well as the 2006 Martin Scorsese film in which he was played by Jack Nicholson. When I was your age, they would say we could become cops or criminals. Today, what I'm saying is this. When you're facing a loaded gun, what's the difference? Part of Bulger's story was the subject of reports on CBS's 60 Minutes. The business they were in was organized crime, and what set Whitey Bulger's organization apart was its penchant for violence. Weeks says it was all part of the folklore of this Irish working-class neighborhood known as Southie. Was it a tough neighborhood when you were growing up, Kevin? You had a fight. You didn't have to win, but you had a fight. On these streets, Whitey Bulger was known as a vicious gangster who never hesitated to use violence. Weeks, who had a reputation as a tenacious street fighter, caught the crime boss's eye while he was working as a bouncer at a local bar. Over the years, he became Bulger's most trusted confidant. What did you do for him? What was your job? Anything he asked me to do. Including murder. For 20 years, Weeks was with the crime boss nearly every day but they were exceedingly careful. This is one of only two known photographs of them together. It was taken at a park called Castle Island where they talk business out of earshot of police bugs. Weeks says the man he called Jimmy was a criminal mastermind. 98% of, the, of uh, his waking hours was dedicated to crime, 2% to pleasure. He was very disciplined. Had no bad habits, he didn't drink, he didn't gamble, didn't do drugs. No bad habits if you don't count murder. And it was something Weeks says Whitey thoroughly enjoyed. How did he kill people? Oh, he, I mean, he stabbed people, he beat people with bats, he shot people, he strangled people, run them over cars. You, you saw, said also that he liked killing. Yeah. Well, explain that to me. After he would kill somebody, he'd, it was like a stress relief. You know, he'd be uh, nice and calm for a couple of weeks afterwards. Like he just got rid of all his stress. Joining me now from Boston to talk about this case, Kevin Cullen of the Boston Globe and Abby Goodenough of the New York Times. What surprises you about this story, that they caught him or the, how they caught him? That they caught him at all. I, Charlie, I think you can put me in the camp of cynics here that wasn't absolutely convinced that the FBI wanted to find this guy. And I know they're saying that um, this was an arrest that led for, you know, directly from the campaign of public service announcements they put out. But I've just spent the day talking to law enforcement officials who are not in the FBI, who spent their entire career trying to take this guy down the right way. And I haven't found one who believes the story is. Nothing that the FBI has said about this case has ever been on the level. So the idea that this is how it's gone down, I have to tell you, no one I know in law enforcement outside the FBI accepts that. So how do you think it went down? Who knows? Maybe she got tired of being on the run. Maybe he got tired of being on the run. But the idea that somebody was watching The View the other day and remembered seeing a woman getting her nails done near Santa Monica, turned her in, and they did this in 48 hours, it just, I don't know. I guess, I guess I've, do, I've done this story too long. I mean, I've, I've been following this close to 30 years, so I guess I'm skeptical, skeptical about everything and associated with it. Abby, tell me what happened here. Well, the story we've been given by the FBI is that, um, you know, they, they started this media campaign with this 30-second public service announcement trying to raise the profile of his girlfriend, Catherine Grieg, on Monday. And uh, within 48 hours, as Kevin said, they get this tip, supposedly, 
Uh, they won't say anything about the tip, who the tipster was, a man, a woman, whether they were in L.A. or not. But based on the public service media campaign they just started, uh, giving them information that led to this address at this kind of shabby apartment building in Santa Monica. And uh, they did some surveillance on it for a couple hours yesterday. Uh, they got a glimpse of them and decided it was really the couple they were looking for. And according to the story we've heard, they went in and, and arrested them with that incident. Kevin, you wrote a five-part series, I know, and, and have done a lot of other work about him. Tell us about who he was and why, um, why there's so much fascination with him. Well, Whitey Bulger was a, uh, you know, his, his incarceration in the 50s and early 60s for bank robbery was fortuitous for him because in the 1960s, it was an Irish mob war, and over 60 guys were murdered as a re result of it. And when he came out of prison, Whitey Bulger, he was able to rise very quickly in, in, in the underworld here in Boston. Now, what happened is he was turned into an informant by the FBI in the late 70s, and that's because the FBI had a national policy to take out La Cosa Nostra, the Italian mafia. The problem with that national policy is it really didn't fit Boston because in Boston, while the Mafia was preoccupied with running numbers and making money in bookmaking, most of the murders carried out in the mob, including those for the Mafia, were subcontracted to the Irish mob, which at that time was run by Whitey Bulger. So Whitey Bulger was a far more dangerous murderer and a dangerous criminal than the people he supposedly was used to get. But as we found out during our investigations, is that he was the FBI's highly, if, you know, highly prized but highly overrated snitch. He gave them virtually nothing. And the, the guy was protected. The narrative, I'd say, Charlie, the big difference of today where we sit now is the narrative is about the change. The Justice Department narrative has always been that there was this rogue agent, John Conley, assisted, assisted by a rogue supervisor agent, John Morris, who assisted Whitey Bulger and allowed him to go out and kill with impunity. But the reality is there was many other FBI agents and many other FBI supervisors that knew about this for years. And that's where this goes now. The, the, the key is who gets to debrief. I mean, I, we could spend all day talking about the arrest and the tips and all that stuff. I don't think that's the issue. The issue is now that he's in custody, who gets to debrief Whitey Balter? I would argue that the FBI has an inherent conflict of interest in this and should not control the investigation from here. There are members of the Massachusetts State Police and the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration who built the case against Whitey Balzer for the charges he is now facing and who have proceeded in the last few years to push for the truth. I would argue those are the folks who should be able to debrief Whitey Balzer because the story now goes, who else protected him in the FBI? So tell me what you think the questions they ought to be asking him. The questions are, and, and like I said, there have been allegations made in, in, in U.S. District Court and also in a, in a district court in Miami where John Conley, who has been convicted of murder and racketeering in his protection of Whitey Bulger, John Conley was his FBI handler. There have been open allegations made by other criminals who were used to convict Conley about other FBI agents receiving money and gifts from Whitey Bulger. None of those agents have ever faced criminal charges. And I've been told by people who have tried to investigate and try to bring more charges, there was a lack of corroboration. And now the potential corroboration is sitting in a court in Los Angeles right now. It, Whitey Bulger used to have the FBI in his pocket. Right now the only thing he has in his pocket is revenge. Whether he chooses to exact that will really de depend on who gets to debrief him and who gets to ask him the questions and where the Justice Department is prepared to take this. Revenge meaning the, where, he will paint his, where he will point his fingers. Absolutely, and, and we know for a fact that he thinks the FBI reneged on a deal. The deal was he would never be taken, he would never face charges as long as he helped them. He thinks he kept up his bargain. Of course, the evidence is overwhelming that Whitey Bulger was murdering people, and particularly murdering people who might be able to turn evidence against him. And as the cases both here in U.S. District Court in Boston and in the District Court in Miami showed, uh, the FBI and, and exactly John Conley and other people within the FBI helped Whitey Bulger to identify potential witnesses against him who would expose this sordid Faustian relationship between Whitey Bulger and the FBI, and those people were murdered. 
Abby, what do we know about Catherine Grieg? Um, Kevin probably knows a lot more than me, but what I know is that she's a former dental hygienist who was his girlfriend. Um, he actually had initially gone on the road with his uh, another girlfriend who was sort of like his Commonwealth common law wife and came back to Boston and dropped her off because she didn't want to go on the road with him when he fled, picked up Catherine, and they hit the road together. Um, the FBI would let us know that she loves animals, that she got her teeth cleaned all the time, all this weird stuff that they thought they put out there hoping or saying it might uh, make people realize that they had seen her in a dentist office or something. And also from neighbors that we have talked to today out in Santa Monica in that apartment building, everybody said she was a really nice woman who was chatty, who liked to talk. She'd go out to the Santa Monica farmer's market and buy organic vegetables. Um, she would tell people that he was had Alzheimer's, she told a few people. Um, that he was sick all the time. Neighbors saw him lying on the couch and watching TV. And uh, one neighbor saw him snapping at Catherine all the time and described him to us as a rageaholic. Mm -hmm. So she, the, the way the neighbors made it sound out there in Santa Monica is like she put up with a lot from him that he was, he bossed her around a lot. That was their impression. Kevin, you know much about her? One of the possibilities here is that Catherine Gregg just got tired of being on the run with this guy. I think what Abby was saying is, is it fits the Whitey Bulger I know. Uh, he's more than a murderer. He's a jerk. He would have been hard to live with, and he certainly would have been hard to live with on the run. Um, and especially if his health was declining, which is what we're getting from our people on the ground out there. That's what the agents involved, uh, some of the law enforcement involved in, in the arrest out there suggested. He, uh, you know, while he looked younger than 81, according to the neighbors, he seemed slightly infirm, which is interesting to me because Whitey was a health fanatic. Uh, I remember, you know, seeing surveillance photos that state police show me of him sl slapping one of his henchmen around because the guy was eating a, a big spread of, of McDonald's greasy food and put it out on the, on the car, and Whitey came out and started whacking him around. Uh, Whitey was a real health nut and took care of his body, was, didn't abuse himself. He liked a glass of wine, but he wouldn't go sit around the, the bar, drink beer, and talk about his criminal exploits. That's what the Italians did with, in their gambling clubs here in Boston. That's how they got put away. I was uh, just going to say that I had heard some of the same things that Kevin was talking about earlier today from some people in other law enforcement agencies saying that they just don't buy for a minute that this is the, the FBI story is actually how this came down. For what it's worth, they, they just think it's impossible that 48 hours pass after the latest attempt at a publicity campaign, and there have been several, and the magic bullet tip comes in. And, you know, some of the theories were that it, it was actually an informant that uh, wanted so much protection that they went ahead and made up this, uh, this, this story about the tipster and the, and the PSA campaign. Who knows? The PSAs Maybe, didn't run... I'm sorry, I, mean, yep. I didn't mean to cut across you. The PSAs didn't even run in the Los Angeles right. market. Right. They ran in San so. Diego and San Francisco, apparently, but uh, not in Los Angeles. And the FBI, uh, the special agent in charge here, ref refused to confirm today whether the tipster had actually heard the PSA. So the movie The Departed, um, Kevin, does it bear any resemblance between the character Jack Nicholson created and the character you have covered? Maybe the menace, but certainly not the physical appearance. Uh, as I said, there was something fastidious about Whitey Bulger, and he took great pride in his uh, appearance. No offense to Jack Nicholson, but he appeared a bit more slovenly than the, the Whitey Bulger I remember uh, when I tried to talk him in the liquor store so many years ago. Again, a field attempt. I mean, uh, Whitey wouldn't talk to me. I don't think he, he never talked to any reporter, except one who he threatened to kill. Um, he did talk to him. He is still in Los Angeles, and will he be brought to Boston soon? They said he'd be brought to Boston. They expected within 48 hours of this morning's press conference, which was around 10.30. Mm -hmm. And I think he's being arraigned right around now as we speak. Do, but, Kevin, did I hear you say you think he might have wanted to be caught? I mean, it's possible. I, like I said, I'm just saying, Charlie, and, and, and Abby, back up, she heard the same things I was hearing from law enforcement people. It doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense that it went down. Uh, and like I said, I talked to a state cop who told me that, you know, 
He couldn't buy the, any of the other lies that the FBI has told him. If they're lying about this to protect an informant or to protect her, he could handle that. But uh, the story just doesn't see, it just seems way too pat. It happened way too quickly. And uh, like I said, I, personally, I, I think that's probably the least interesting aspect of the whole story because the question of is, will Whitey Bulger talk? And if, in fact, he's going to talk, who is he going to talk to? Um, if I'm Whitey Bulger, I'm not talking to the FBI if what, I, if what I've got is on them. I'm talking to somebody else. Has there been an ongoing, an ongoing series of journalistic inquiries about the FBI and the way they handle this case? Oh, God. <laughs> Where do you want to start? I mean, like I said, every time there was a reported sighting, I, I, I wrote a column a couple of years ago saying, you know, they, they have sightings of him in London and Dublin and Rome. Why, did, why is there never like a sighting of him in Podgorica, Mont Montenegro? It's always in these beautiful places that they have sightings. And, you know, P the FBI agents would jump on a plane and fly out there. And it, it, it was, we've always questioned, were they really looking for him? And, you know, um, the, the special agent in charge of the Boston office here addressed that today and said he knew that people didn't believe that they were out there or that there were some people who didn't believe the FBI was really out there looking for him, but he contended that they never wavered. And, you know, I, I always looked at it, the guys, I know some guys on the task force, they have called me over the years asking me what I knew, especially when it came to this idea that he would go to Ireland, which is patent nonsense. The, the last place Whitey Bulger would have went to hide out is Ireland. But, um, you know, I have no doubts that the individual law enforcement officers on that task force to find him wanted to find him. The question is, how much backup was there in pay grades above him? And was the Justice Department has absolutely dragged its feet on many of these cases in which victims' families have been seeking justice and apology and compensation. And I talked one of the, I got a text at 5 o'clock in the morning today from a guy named Tommy Donahue. Tommy Donahue was eight years old when Whitey Bulger murdered his father, Michael Donahue, a truck driver, totally innocent, made the mistake of giving a ride to somebody that Whitey Bulger wanted dead because John Conley and the FBI told Whitey Bulger that this guy was going to give him up. And Tommy Donahue said to me, you know, we may never get justice, we may never get any money, but, you know, I was able to wake my mother up on the second floor today and tell her they caught the guy who killed Dad. That's the story you wrote today in the Boston Globe. Yeah, that's actually, that was online by 9 o'clock this morning. You know, a, a family, because like I said, I, th I think when people see these images of an 81-year-old daughtering, you know, he's our Carmen Gigante, the guy walking around in the bathrobe <laughs> yes. in New York. He's going to be this guy that looks infirm, who knows what he said, you know, but this is a guy who murdered people, who murdered real, real people, who ruined real families. And of all the families that I've come in contact with, of, of the ones that I think of the most in a time like this, are the Donahue's of Dorchester. Right. Who, you know, Pat Donahue was left with three little boys to raise, and the Wheelers of Oklahoma, two totally innocent men who came across a guy who was out there, and with the assistance of the FBI, with the active complicity of the FBI, was out there murdering potential witnesses against them. Do we know anything about where he's been in the last 16 years? They did say, right, Kevin, that the, the only or the last uh, credible sighting of him was in London near Piccadilly Circle or Square in 2002. Yeah, exactly. And I always thought that was an interesting choice of words. Credible according to whom? <laughs> it was credible according to the FBI. Right. They never let us talk to the alleged witness. And I'll tell you the other thing. The people on the ground in Santa Monica were telling our reporters out there today that these people have lived there since the mid-90s. Jimmy went on the run. I call him Jimmy because nobody in Salty calls him Whitey. J uh, <laughs> Whitey Bulger went on the run in, you know, in 19, well, he actually left before the indictment in 94, was heading back, and then was warned not to come back to Boston and, and, and took off in 95. So that would jive with what the, it sounds to me like he was there the whole time. He went right out eventually, crisscrossed his way across the states, and went to California. The other thing I find really interesting is that when he picked up his, his original, uh, it's more or less, as Babby said, her common-law wife, Teresa Stanley. She decided she didn't want to be on the lam with him, so he dropped her off, and he went to get Kathy Gregg. He picked her up in a very down-by-the-heels beach here in Boston. It's called Malibu Beach. Okay. And that's where, that's where their run began. And if you go across country, and if you walk down the promenade 
in Santa Monica and walk out in the pier and turn right, you can look up and in the distance, you can see the real Malibu Beach. <laughs> Great point. What kind of conversations are you having today, Abby, with uh, following this story? Well, a, uh, a team of us, our conversations are people who live in that apartment building and around it out in Santa Monica, uh, people of various law enforcement agencies who have followed him in this case over the years, uh, people who have written books on the case, God knows there have been a lot of them, um, and just people in, out in Boston on the street because really like everybody was waking each other up in the night last night it wasn't just reporters it was so many people in Boston with the news and people couldn't sleep and people it, it really somebody said it's kinda like Boston's own Osama bin Laden being found obviously it's different but there really was something of that to it so we talked to a lot of people in Southie and other places around town too just about what what it means to them because it is such uh, just kind of a huge piece of the culture yeah. here. Kevin, last question. Among the people you know uh, who've been following this case closely, do they accept and believe the theory of the case that you have articulated throughout this conversation? Well, like I said, I would say everybody outside the FBI accepts the theory that I just outlaid because they're the ones that gave me the theory <laughs> uh, with all sorts of other corroboration. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, it, this, this is the ultimate, this was Whitey's greatest strength. He divided law enforcement so that they were fighting with each other more than they were actually trying to get him. And uh, that's where this goes from here. Let's see if law enforcement can actually do the right thing. And, and finally, Lance the Boyle that's been there for the FBI. Hey, it's been a great day for the FBI. They made the arrest. Let's see how the year turns out. And, you know, Osama bin Laden, Ratko Mladic, and now Whitey Balder. It's not been a couple of good months for serial killers. <laughs> Thank Seriously. you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, Abby. Thanks. Mr. Whitey Bulger was Boston's most notorious criminal. He led the Winter Hill Gang and is linked to 19 murders from the 1970s and 80s. For years, in what is considered one of the great failures in the history of federal law enforcement, Bulger was given protection by the FBI for being an informant. In 1995, he was tipped off by an FBI official, made the top 10 most wanted list, and became America's most famous fugitive. Sixteen years later, he was caught in Santa Monica, California. Now he is awaiting his trial in June when he will be facing charges for his connection to 19 murders. Joining me now, Boston Globe reporters Kevin Cullen and Shelley Murphy. They've covered Whitey Bulger for over 25 years and have now written a book about him. It is called Whitey Bulger, America's Most Wanted Gangster and the Manhood That Brought Them to Justice. Also joining me, John Miller, senior correspondent for CBS News and my colleague on CBS News this morning. Um, well. Thanks, Great Charlie. to have you here. This is from the federal judge today. He ruled that gangster James Whitey Bulger uh, cannot present evidence to a jury about his claim that he was given immunity for future crimes, including murder. So we'll learn more about him from this conversation. How do you think he is approaching this trial? What's his mindset? He can't wait for it. Um, Shelley and I had access to his letters that he's written from. He's quite a jail correspondent. And uh, he's really looking forward to his day in court because he's going to take the stand, which is very unusual. Somebody charged with murder, you generally don't take the yeah, stand. Right. But he can't wait to. As he calls it in the letters, he calls this the big show, the big circus. And he wants, more than anything, Charlie, he wants to refute the narrative. The narrative that you know, he's somebody who informed on his friends, killed people, and killed two women. He says he really wants to say, I was never an informer, and I never killed those women. And this is not about getting acquitted. This is about getting even. It's very Boston. Characterize him for me. Well, I mean, he's a very charismatic guy. I think that if he was just pure evil and all we knew were the bad things, there wouldn't be really that much interest in him. Um, but he managed, you know, through much of his life to cultivate this reputation as the good gangster so that in Southie for a lot of years people thought that he really was some, some sort of Robin Hood figure who kept yeah. the drugs out. And, of course, what, what we found over the years is that he really was taking tribute from drug dealers and actually at one point was in a car delivering cocaine to the projects in Southie. But I think he worked very hard to create um, this image of himself as a good guy. And, and, he, and that's what he'll be fighting for in his trial, his reputation. All right. uh, Sixteen years on the lam. Mm -hmm. Finally caught in Santa Monica. Uh, and he said 
Was it a cat that he said? Yeah, he said a cat got him a captured, cat caught which is me. true. How did they capture him? Well, you know, the first two years, we tried to explain this. Um, I don't believe the FBI was looking for him. In fact, they assigned the search for him to the very organized crime squad, squad that he had corrupted. So uh, by the time he got out to Santa Monica, he was really kind of, the trail had gone completely cold. And then, you know, legitimate, serious law enforcement people were looking for him, but they couldn't find him. Um, and then the task force was actually very big at one point, but by 2010, it was really effectively down to an FBI agent and a deputy U.S. marshal named Neil Sullivan. And they decided, they had this think fest, and they said, you know, we keep looking for Bulger, but he looks like every Irish American guy in town. So, you know, why don't we try to focus on the woman, Catherine Gregg? That was his companion who was with him the whole time. So they put these, you know, public service announcement together. And then uh, they put it in a number of markets, but they actually didn't put it in L.A. It wasn't in the L.A. market, but CNN did a story about the effort. And a woman who had known them from Santa Monica was sitting in her apartment in Reykjavik in Iceland. In Iceland. And she says, that's Carol Gasco. And the reason she would have recognized him, that she had a relationship with Kathy Gregg, who she knew as Carol, because Kathy took care of the stray cat in the neighborhood. And she loved cats, too. She actually wrote a book about cats. And so when she saw the picture, she goes, that's them. And she calls the FBI in, in Los Angeles. They, call, they, they send the reports up to, to Boston. And Neil Sullivan sort of was intrigued by it because it, it was ticking off boxes. He said, the, the tipster said, the woman was nice and the guy was nasty. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's saying, wait a minute. And <laughs> they flew out there and you know, it, after looking for him for 16 years and not finding him, this thing happened really fast. And one of the funny things we found in his letter, why do you always vowed he was gonna go out in a blaze of glory? He's not gonna, he's not gonna go back to prison. He always said that. And there, there was a scene, a very dramatic scene, in which he refused when the, the cops surrounded him. They lured him out into the garage. They surrounded him, said, get down, you know, or we'll shoot. And he wouldn't get down on his knees, which you say, wow, that's a really defiant thing to do. But in the letters we saw, he said the reason he wouldn't get down on his knees is because when he looked onto the garage, it was stained with oil and gas. And he didn't want to get his pants dirty. That was it. In the parking lot, they said, get down. Get down on the ground. And he said, hey. I'm wearing white pants. And, you know, these young agents had never encountered anybody um, who, I mean, you know. They don't call them whitey for nothing. Yeah. John, detail for us the relationship with the FBI. Well, I think... Later in many ways, and where he wasn't, at least he saw himself that way. But if you look at him, you know, from a 360 degree angle, it's... He wasn't selling drugs, he was shaking down all the drug dealers. He wasn't running gambling operations, all the gambling operations had to pay him. Um, and rather than the, the model that uh, an FBI agent goes out and recruits an informant and then exploits that informant, I think what Whitey did was he recruited an FBI agent and exploited that FBI agent. In every instance, he seemed to turn the conventional model around to work for him, and that's exactly what he did with the FBI. The FBI would tell you that they ran Whitey Bulger as a CI, a confidential informant from the high echelon program for, you know, a dozen years. Whitey Bulger would tell you, I ran an FBI agent as my informant. I gave him information that I knew he already knew or that was valueless, and in turn, we got to find out everything that was going on in that squad, and unfortunately... And avoid detection. And, on, and avoid arrest. Um, take out the competition. And, 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 <laughs> take and kill a lot of people along the way. So it was, it was a bad chapter for the FBI, um, and one where they had to really rewrite the book on the handling of informants. And what have they acknowledged? Well, I'm going to defer to these guys who have covered the civil cases, but yeah. uh, whatever they haven't acknowledged has certainly... Um, they've been on the losing end of a number of these mm -hmm. cases where the families of Whitey Bulger's victims... Um, have sued. Certainly what they acknowledged tacitly by rewriting the informant guidelines was these had to be tightened up. The old model was very basic, which is you trust the agent who's running that informant to report everything up the chain and that that's good enough. Um, the new model is that that has to be audited and looked at and signed off by a number of people up that chain. But, you know, 
from the time that Whitey Bulger operated, um, the reports of his information or that he was being run and supplying information were being run right up to the highest echelons of the FBI and the Department of Justice. What was not being reported up the chain was that he was not just running the criminal operations they expected, gambling, loan sharking, um, but that he was committing series of murders based on information that the corrupt FBI agent who was supposedly running him, although I think it was the other way around, was giving him. Okay. Let's take a couple of things we ought to say about him. First of all, his brother is, is a former president of the Massachusetts Senate and the University of Massachusetts? Correct. Right? Yes. He was one of the most powerful, Billy Bulger, yeah. one of the most powerful politicians in Massachusetts. And what's the relationship between the two? Very, very close. close. Very close. In fact, Billy, you know, his, his position is he's my brother. I love him. I will not condemn him. And I stand by him. And stand by him means? He shows up in court. When Whitey's in court, Billy is there in the front row for support. Billy's visiting him in jail. And, and frankly, I think Billy, um, he, I think there's some denial that his brother could have done these awful things that he's charged with. Yeah. We found that Billy was really um, important to Whitey when he could put away for bank robbery in 1956. Billy was his protector on the outside. He really lined up an incredible stable of influential supporters, which included House Speaker John McCormick, who actually grew up in the same US neighborhood. U.S. House Speaker. The U.S. House Speaker John McCormick. And then we found out, when Shelley and I were doing the research, we found out that Whitey had a sort of a prison pen pal, and that this guy actually became his parole advisor and helped him get parole. His name was Robert Drynan then the dean of the law school at Boston College, right, later right, the remember. congressman, right, right. including the first Father congressman, Drynan. Father Drynan, the first guy. To, and so Billy helped get this sort of stable of very influential supporters. And I think, you know, why to get out after nine years of a 20-year sentence for a bank robbery, but I think what was even more important for that episode is that Whitey realized that the perception of power was just as important as the exercise of it, and that it really helped to have politicians yeah. In your pocket. And, yeah, and that, I that's think a if, lesson that Henry Kissinger suggests as well. I think if you if you look at the 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 less than subtle or the more subtle ways, um, even when there was a new FBI supervisor who came into Boston and said we're going to straighten this whole thing out, and he was pushing to drop Whitey from the informant program, saying, you know, this guy is trouble, and you know, um, he had a very interesting meeting in uh, in Bulger's office in the Massachusetts Senate, where he said you know, you should enjoy yourself in Boston and you should think about your future. You know, you're not going to be an FBI guy forever. After that, we can get you a nice job with the state. Now, he never said, and by the way, don't drop my brother as an informant, but it was just a very unusual meeting to be talking about somebody's future when they were the brand new guy in charge of the squad that was running your brother who was running, you know, organized crime on the south end of Boston. It's easy to romanticize him. We try not to. We, I mean... When Shelley and I sat down to write this book, you know, it, at one level we said there have probably been too many books about Whitey yeah. Bulger, but by the same token, I think he was sort of a one-dimensional cutout character. He was almost a caricature of his pathology, and we really wanted to put some skin on these mythical bones, fill him out. Who is he? He, you know, when you say he's a monster, that kind of means that it. Then there's no more to say if he's a monster. He's a man, and we tried to get he's an that. Evil we, man. We didn't. We didn't diminish his crimes by any any stretch of the imagination. But we wanted to figure out what made him tick. Obviously, the the FBI protecting you helps, but he had to have something. He had to have charisma because, as I think Shelley, uh, we were talking about this earlier. One of his uh, associates said, "If Whitey wanted you to like him." you would like him. And if he didn't, you were in trouble. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's the most gruesome thing he did? I mean, there's a story of choking the young woman in front of two of his friends. Yeah, I mean, I think those are the most gruesome stories. The, the, well, really, all, all many of them. But, but I, they, think, I think the torture, the, women the, the personal the, torture yeah. he took part in of some of the informants was beyond the pain. Chaining, chaining um, John McIntyre to a chair and, and questioning him for hours. Same thing with another victim, trying to find out where his money was hidden for hours, questioning him and then That's leaving him. That's not torture, him. questioning him. What, what was it? Well, torture? no, and then, and then that, leaving That was him. built in. It, it was sort of a mental, I mean, to leave him there, well, you know, thinking, you know, this 
this guy, Bucky Barrett, he knew that he house. knew he was going to die, and they left him there for hours asking him about, um, you know, drug r running and where money was hidden, and then left him to go collect money at his house where he had kept his money. He actually had to call his home and say to his wife, you know, leave the house with our young baby, and she left, and Whitey and, and his partner, Flemmy, allegedly went to the house, got the money, went back, and then killed him. After they rounded up all the money, about the did they shoot him? Shoot him or what? Yeah, shot yeah him they the shot him in the head. And, and and but another thing is, you know, Whitey had this reputation: strangle a woman and then lie down and take a nap. Yeah, there was there, there was that was some of the stuff that was really disturbing. Almost the, the mundane nature. He carried this out as almost like he was going to work. And you know, you mentioned he's charged with several cases of, of shooting someone in the back of the head. And yet we found when he was on the run. And when he was in Louisiana, he was, you know, befriended a family down there, some Cajun family. And there was a situation when a puppy had to be put down, and he couldn't watch the dog be shot. And when the dog was shot, the report of the, of the gun, he started weeping. So you had, he's crying over a dog that was put so down. how do you figure this out? <laughs> I'm not a psychiatrist, well, I, Charlie. I just play one in my newspaper column. I find it kind of. <laughs> I find it interesting, though, that now he's writing from jail that he's the one who's, you know, the victim of his government. How yeah. cold and heartless the government is, and how dare they, you know, sentence my girlfriend to eight years yeah. in prison for helping me. I, he has these I still literary. don't understand this conundrum, though, and maybe you guys can help me out, but. First, he denies he was ever an informant, right. and now he says I've they promised right. him immunity. Right. Yeah. So, if he wasn't an informant, why did they tell him you can go commit all these crimes? Either way you take it, it's confusing. How? But he's a guy who thinks everything out. Absolutely. So, how did he think this one out? Does he have a alternative explanation where this works? I have a theory that what he's going to argue that they nothing was done by the book. So he's going to say, I didn't sign this off, I didn't do this. I think he's looking for a technical... Th the one thing you have to remember about Whitey, he always thinks he's the smartest guy in the room. So he's going to come up with some kind of explanation. But you're right, John, these things are mutually exclusive. You can't... Why would he be an informant and not have immunity? Why would he have immunity if he was not an informant? doesn't make any sense. But this guy, you know, there's a lot of grandiosity in there. So I was laughing when we read in the letters, he, he compares himself to Philip Nolan the protagonist from yeah, oh yeah. the Edward right, Everett Hill right, short right. story, A Man Without a Country. Right. And uh, I would suggest he's more like Jippo Nolan. The book is called Whitey Bulger, uh, America's Most Wanted Gangster and the Manhood That Brought Him to Justice. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie, my friend, great to have you. Back in a moment. Stay with us.